Good day, everyone. Brian here. Hope all is well with you. Uh, so today we are getting into the second chapter of John. Just want to let you guys know, uh, we will not have a video tomorrow, today, Saturday. We will not have them on Sunday as we will be live streaming our church service at five o'clock on this YouTube channel. So uh, no video tomorrow, but we'll resume on Monday where we leave off today. So today we get into Jesus's ministry and we see the first of his miracles or signs in the Gospel of John. It actually says that this is the first one he did overall, and it, and it has a ton of significance to it. So let's go ahead and get into it. John 2, we're going to go verses 1 through 12. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted, the water now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. So here we have Jesus' first miracle, or his first sign, as the Gospel of John likes to call them, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but just some background information so we can best understand what is taking place here. So this was probably a relative of Jesus or a family friend who is getting married. And so Jesus goes down with his disciples um, to this wedding and Mary comes up and says they've run out of wine. So this is a big deal. So weddings back then could last up to seven days. And so the celebration would sometimes last up to seven days as well. And this was a culture of shame that they lived in. So if you were to run out of wine during the wedding celebration, that was a huge deal and would have brought you extraordinary amounts of shame. No one would have ever forgot about that and people would have thought the wedding is doomed the marriage is doomed because you ran out of wine and so we see here this is no small deal that they had run out of wine it's not like oh they run out of wine let's go home no this would have brought the family shame for the rest of their lives and so with that being said Mary turns to Jesus and says hey can you help out here um, now, I don't know if she's expecting him to do a miracle. It seems that way because she tells the servants to do whatever he tells you. Like, she knew that Jesus had the power to do something. And we remember back to his birth and the angel had come and said, I'm going to uh, conceive in you the Messiah, right? And, and Mary knew full well she was a virgin when she had Jesus, that this was no just ordinary person. And so she comes to Jesus in faith and says, can you, can you help out here? Can you do something? And there's no mention of Joseph, Jesus' dad here. Um, most people think he's probably dead at this point in Jesus' life, that somewhere between his birth and here, where Jesus is about 30 years old, uh, that Joseph had passed away. And so J Jesus was now the oldest child in that family, and he was to look after the family. And so Jesus take, tells these servants to go grab these six jars of water that were used for ceremonial washing in the Jewish culture. They had a whole bunch of customs where they would have to wash their hands before meals. And if they became unclean, they would have to wash themselves. Sometimes just their hands. Sometimes they would have to do full body immersions in water to cleanse themselves of, of some kind of defilement. Okay, And so Jesus has them bring these jars. And it says that each held 20 or 30 gallons. So 
when we look at this, Jesus is not making some small amount of wine here. We are talking like possibly 100 to 150 gallons worth of wine, far exceeding what they would need, I would hope. <laughs> but um, we see this is no small thing. And so they, they take these jars and they take it to the master of the feast. And he tastes it and he says, oh, you saved the good wine till now. So this was not some kind of, some, some scholars have tried to argue that Jesus didn't actually make wine. He made grape juice, something like that. Uh, that's just bringing our own personal bias into the text. He made wine. And by the fact that he says that he brought, saved the good wine until now, probably means it wasn't watered down wine. Uh, which happened quite a bit back then in the day. Their wine was quite a bit more diluted than what we drink today. But here he's saying, you've saved the good wine until now. So that brings up just kind of just side note, okay? So we talk about alcohol and uh, Christianity. And Jesus here makes water into wine. There's no doubt about that. And it's good wine, right? Um, People often like to say that Christians shouldn't drink, they shouldn't do this, that it's a sin to drink alcohol. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. Now, does it have a lot of warnings against drunkenness? Absolutely. Uh, drunkenness sh should have no place in the life of a Christian. Uh, Scripture is quite clear about that, but moderate drinking of alcohol is nowhere prohibited in the Bible. In fact, the Bible says that wine was given to us by God for celebration in times like these. Um, to make the heart merry, to make it joyful. And so it's kind of a blessing of God, and like all of God's blessings that He's given to us, we can overuse it. Um, we can indulge in it too much, and that blessing can actually become a curse, as alcohol does when um, we overuse it. So there's a couple things I want to draw out from this text for us today, and the first is this. Jesus meets people's needs. The groom here, so it was the groom's family who was in charge of the celebration and putting this all on. He saves this groom from never-ending shame. He would have been shamed for the rest of his life. And we see this with all of Jesus' miracles. He never just does a miracle for the sake of being seen or anything like that. It's always to meet a human need of some sort whether it be hunger, whether it be sickness, whether it be public shame here. Jesus meets people's needs. So to Jesus, the saving this man from public disgrace was much more important than him having this ceremonial water jars on hand um, to do some kind of ritual. And that's what we see with Jesus a lot. He's never impressed by religious ritual in any way. What does he say the two most important commandments are? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He's never impressed with us just going through the motions of doing religious stuff, right? He wants us, he wants our religion to be seen in loving other people. He, he desires mercy, not sacrifice. James uh, 1 actually talks about this. James was the brother of Jesus who actually did not believe in him until after Jesus rose from the dead, and then he becomes a leader of the church in Jerusalem. James 1.26 says this, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And that's what we see with Jesus. We see him always wanting us to love on other people, not just to go through the motions, to do this or this, to try to please God, but that really pleasing God is seen in us loving our neighbor as ourself, to love widows, to love orphans, to, uh, to give freely of oneself to help them out, just as Jesus did. Our next point is that Jesus' miracles are all, as John's gospel really points out, they're signs, right? And these signs all point to some great, deep truth about Jesus. And we'll see that time and time again as we go through here. They're never for just show, but they point to some deep, deep truths, as we're going to talk about 
right now as this is extremely highly symbolic here of what Jesus does with this ceremonial washing water being turned into wine. So in a way, the ceremonial washing, these jars full of water, they really represent the Old Testament or the Old Covenant that God had with the Israelites, right? And that if they were defiled, they had to go through these motions. They had to do these things in order to um, come back with God's people, to come into the temple. They had to do these things and so they would not be defiled anymore, um, so that they would be clean before God. And so they had to do all these things, whether it's hand washing or full body immersion in the water, in order to come before the Lord and to be in His presence. And back then the people would always... As we talked about the other day, they'd have to give uh, these sacrifices for sins all the time. And it was a never-ending thing because you know what? You'd offer a sacrifice for sin and then you know what you'd do? You'd sin again. So then you'd have to offer another another sacrifice. So it was never-ending. It just went on and on and on and on. So the water pot, pots here really represent that, that Old Testament, that cleansing, that sacrificial system, right? What does the wine represent? Well, throughout the Bible... Wine represents celebration. And we're going to read about a couple passages that have to do with wine here in a bit. But it also has this idea of celebration and good times and and joy, right? So in this miracle, we go from this idea of sacrifice and ceremonial washing to this new era of grace. We see this in the groom, right? We see grace happen firsthand here. This groom was totally helpless. He screwed up. It was his fault. He was in charge to make sure there was going to be enough wine on hand, and he fell short. He didn't do it. And yet we see Jesus come to his aid and to help him out, even though in no way is he deserving of Jesus to make this happen. Jesus just does it out of his own good will. And that's exactly what grace is. Grace is an unmerited gift before God. It's you getting a gift that you in no way deserve. That's what true grace is. God's blessing to us, even though we don't deserve it in any way. Actually, the opposite. We deserve the opposite of that. We deserve His wrath, but He gives us His blessing. That's grace, right? And that's the first thing about grace. You can't earn it. You can't go through the motions, right? You can't just go through all these religious rituals to earn God's grace or else it would cease to be grace in the first place because grace is totally unmerited. And yeah, you know what? That doesn't make a lot of sense to us as human beings because what do we, what do we preach here, all right? You get what you deserve or, or sayings like that. And that's not God's way. This whole idea of grace is totally foreign to us because we think that we have to earn everything that we get. That's not what Jesus says. That's not Christianity. First, you can't earn grace. Second, grace is not cheap. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was the first um, to come up with this idea of cheap grace, that we kind of use grace as like this get out of jail free card, but instead it's like a get out of hell free card, right? So we'll all stand before the judge one day and he'll go through our lives and let's say we just did our own thing. We did whatever we wanted in this life. It was all about me, but maybe I went to church here and there and I heard about this grace thing and then God will look me and I will stand before the judge and then I'll pull out this card and say, grace, I'm out of, I'm, I'm out of hell free, right? I'm good. That's not what grace is. It's not a card you play to try to weasel your way out of uh, judgment or hell. You see, grace isn't cheap at all because it cost God his son. It cost Jesus his life up there on that cross. And so for us to use it in that way of like a get out of hell free card um, does not take that into account. It doesn't really appreciate what Jesus did for us up on that cross in a way we're just kind of using him for our own personal means which is totally not um, what we should be getting out of grace. Next, grace is not an excuse to sin. We see this in Romans 6. Paul writes, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? 
By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Any grace that gives us an excuse to sin or sees sin as okay is not biblical grace. And a lot of people, I mean, will be confronted with something they're doing in their lives um, that is totally against God's will, and they'll just go back to that grace. It's like they're playing their get out of jail free card, right? They'll say, well, God's grace. Well, if you see grace in that way, you don't understand biblical grace in any way. If anything, grace properly understood means this. When you truly understand grace and what it is that God has done for you through Jesus Christ, properly understood, it means you owe him everything. And that's why true biblical grace is a really tough concept. Because you see that he gave you everything, though you deserve nothing. And so what is our right response there? It's to give him everything. This groom would have been forever indebted to Jesus because Jesus saved him from public shame for the rest of his life. Think of it this way. Let's say somehow you get into some money problems and you owe, let's say, $250 million. And so you go before the judge and there's no way you can pay this off. And the judge says, okay, you're going to jail until you pay it off, which will be never. Then a man walks in, a person you never have met, and he says, here's a check for $250 million. I pay it in his place. And you go scot-free. You get off innocent. Think about how indebted to that person you would be. How gr- grateful you would be for what they did for you. You would voluntarily, out of your own free will, become that person's servant. Because you would love that man so much for what he did for you because he saved you from a life of prison. On the cross, that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He came and he paid the penalty that we never could. Even though we did nothing whatsoever to deserve it, he came and died in our place. So that by putting our faith in him, we may have everlasting life with him. Just like that man who comes in and pays your fine in a court, right? You are forever indebted to that person. Not because you have to be, but because you want to be. So with Jesus, we don't have to keep going through the religious rituals, right? To keep cleaning our hands and going through all these things. Because he has paid the price once and for all. And through him and through him alone, you are cleansed forevermore. And instead of going through all all the cycle and all these things, we can celebrate. We can rejoice because of what he's done for us. The water has been turned into wine. And although it is a time for celebration right now, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you can have that joy in your heart right now because you know that you have a relationship with God through Him. There's still work to be done here on earth, right? Jesus calls us to go and to invite more people into the kingdom to share the good news of what He has done so that in that last day, when this world is rolled up like a scroll and heaven comes upon us, the actual kingdom of heaven, we will be joined by our brothers, by our sisters, by our friends, by our co-workers, by all those we love. And then the celebration will truly begin. I want to read for you a section from Isaiah 25. Isaiah was a prophet about 700 years before Jesus. Um, But he foresaw uh, this time um, what we would call heaven. 
when the kingdom of God literally comes down on the earth. And he writes this, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will per- On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of the people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his sal. And so, yes, there is an ultimate celebration coming. We can have joy in our hearts right now knowing that Jesus has saved us from sin and from death. But especially in these times, if you belong to Jesus Christ, keep it in the forefront of your mind that you do not belong to this world. This is not your home. We are sojourners. We are pilgrims here. Our home is coming, and it is a home where there is no more sickness. There is no more death, where God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And we will have a celebration like no other that will last for all time, where we will be with our Lord, with our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we will see him face to face in his kingdom. And if you're here today and you don't belong to him or you're not sure if you do, that can all change in the matter of a second. Repent. Turn from your ways and put your faith in him as your Lord and Savior, that he died on a cross for you in your place. There's nothing you can do to make yourself right with God. But Jesus has come, and he has done it for you. Trust in that. and Trust him with your life right now as your Lord.